Okay, welcome to Gospel Backgrounds Lesson 5. We're going to be looking at Jesus the Nazarene, and this will cover all of Matthew chapter 2 and the last section of Luke chapter 2. As always, we want to remember Acts 17 11. Now, those Jews in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Though they received the word with all eagerness, they searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. So that is our reminder not just to take anyone's word for it, but uh, to go back and look at the Bible to have that be our ultimate source of reference. So in this chapter, we're going to be looking at a few things. We're going to be looking at a little bit of background in Herod. Really, any study of Jesus is going to be uh, improved by understanding the cultural and geopolitical environment of Rome, fairly new on the scene in those days, and then the the Herod and his descendants kind of ruling the land um, after that. Uh, the three wise men, or actually the not three wise men, because the Bible never says there are only three. So picking up from uh, lesson four, we will continue our uh, <laughs> attempt to dispel all of the myths around in Christmas that many of us hold dear. And so uh, I'm sorry, that's just what we have to do. Uh, we got to be true to the scripture, like Acts 17, 11 says. Uh, next will be the flight to Egypt, then the return to Nazareth, and we'll conclude by looking at the 12-year-old Jesus uh, that episode where he is at the temple and really the only highlight of, of Jesus' childhood is this episode of the temple. Matthew chapter 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he that has been born king of the Udioi? And just to um, remove any ambiguity, where the gospel writers write the Jews, we will translate that as Udio, just to kind of keep, keep that distinction in mind. For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. As we mentioned earlier, a study of the life of Jesus to really be complete from a cultural and geopolitical understanding has to include a discussion of Herod and, and the Herod Herodian dynasty. Um, in 39 BCE, Herod was in Rome and the Roman Senate gave Herod the honorary title, the King of the Jews. What's interesting about this is Herod wasn't even in this part of the world at the time, he was in Rome. The land, uh, what we call today Israel, was temporarily conquered by the Parthians, who were Rome's traditional enemies off to the east. So they would, they would have been in the lands of Persia and, and Babylon today. And interestingly, probably where the Magi came from, where the Magi might have been Parthians. So that'll, that'll have some intrigue as we get into that, uh, that part of the Matthew 2. Second, Herod wasn't even Jewish. Uh, he was an Edomite by birth. His family was forced converted during the Hasmonean period. So if you remember the Maccabean revolt in uh, 166, um, they basically did everything that uh, that the Greeks were doing, only they, they flipped it around. And, and so they had forced conversions and forced circumcisions and you know didn't, didn't really ingratiate themselves to the non-Jewish uh, population. But anyway, um, Herod served Rome for 33 years faithfully. I mean, he was, he was very skilled and shrewd politician. This map here is listing some of his campaigns. So what you might see across the top was Herod returns from Rome, 39 BC. So he's been given the title King of the Jews, and now he's got to go kick out the Parthians to actually you know, claim the title and, and own the land. There's actually one anecdote about Herod that really will tell you all you need to know. So Herod was a longtime friend and ally of, ally of a guy you might have heard of named Mark Antony. Um, Mark Antony was defeated by Octavian at the Battle of Actium in 31 uh, BC. Uh, Octavian was later known as Caesar Augustus, so now Herod's got a problem, right? His best friend was the enemy of the guy who is now in charge of the whole show. So instead of waiting around to be dispatched as a co-conspirator who chose the wrong side, which probably would have been his fate, ultimately, Herod instead um, was shrewd, as I mentioned, and boldly went before Augustus. And he is recorded as saying, ask me not whose friend I was. Instead, ask me what sort of friend I can be. Um, he later went on to describe the fact that this part of the world, the land we call Israel, is vital to Rome's interests. It provided access to the wealth of Syria, 
to the uh, north and east, and then Egypt to the south and west. So anyway, this ploy worked. Um, he, Octavian incorporated Herod into his administration. So this just gives you uh, one little insight of Herod's skill as a politician. And in a sense, the entire Bible is all about usurpers. So starting back in Genesis 3 with the serpent tricking man and woman into thinking that our way as humans is better than God's divine way for us. That deception really continues to this day in the geopolitical world all around us as we see governments trying to claim that they know better than, you know, we should follow their rule and not God's rule. Um, it is also true within us individually. You know, Paul says that he struggles with the flesh. You know, I, I do what I don't want to do or, you know, things like that. So that is around us and within us, this, this battle of the, the usurping uh, forces that are trying to take the rightful place of having God on the throne. So in a sense, we have Herod is the phony king of the Jews who isn't even Jewish, while now on the scene, Jesus is the rightful one who was actually born king of the Jews. Herod represents darkness. Jesus represents light. Uh, as we looked at with his conversation with Octavian, Herod smooth talked and ultimately murdered his way into power. Uh, he would he would murder anyone who got in his way, including members of his own family. Um, so he's, he's pretty ruthless in that regard. He was a terrible uh, despotic dictator, so he was very much hated by the people. Um, but contrast that with the fact that Jesus made himself a humble servant. He would often say, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, it's noted that Herod was buried with great pomp and riches while Jesus was unjustly executed and, and buried in a tomb that while a, a rich man owned it, it was in Jesus' own tomb. And most importantly, Herod is still dead while Jesus is alive. So a lot of contrast there. And of course, once we get to the book of Revelation is really when God is going to set the record straight and you know, all the all the usurping forces come to an end and, and God will establish his rightful government uh, for the world. So we've looked at uh, Bethlehem in the Annunciations video. So this is really just a refresher. It's about four to five miles from Jerusalem, so very close. The, the main road in the center uh, here is, you know, from leading from Jerusalem and then down to uh, down to Bethlehem it's called the Way of the Patriarchs. Um, Jesus was born probably somewhere between 8 and 4 BC. Um, a lot of people land on 5 BC, some, some say 4. Um, so there's a legitimate question, how can Jesus be born BC? Um, and there's a, an explanation that a sixth century monk set up the uh, the calendar and, and made a mistake in determining the dates, and it's it's still not corrected. So we've we've still got BC and AD kind of at the wrong place. So um, you'll see that a lot of scholars and uh, and and others, really a lot of secular world, will use the terms uh, CE for Common Era and BCE for before common era. In fact, I'll probably go back and forth. Um, AD stands for Anno Domini, year of our Lord, and BC, which of course means before Christ. So while there's a degree of being non-offensive, um, at least if you use BCE, you can't say Jesus was born before Christ. So it, it at least corrects that error. So I personally don't have a problem with CE and BCE. Um, it is non-offensive, and Romans 12, 8 says we should be at peace with all men as, as much as in our ability. So it's not like we're denying any critical doctrine by saying CE instead of BC. So whichever way you want, uh, it, it's not really not worth getting offended at <laughs> um, if you do see the term B, uh, CE or BCE. Herod was paranoid about his power. And he was known to eliminate any potential threats, as I mentioned, including those of his own family. So this is a picture of Masada, which is really to the south, uh, southeast of Jerusalem, not that far, but you've got to go around around the mountains to get there. Um, he built Masada as a place where he could flee in case of a revolt of the people. And, and ironically, Masada has become a symbol of Jewish freedom and independence, really similar to what the Alamo uh, means to us Texans. Uh, near the very end of the first Jewish revolt, and that was from 66 to 72, 
um, a band of rebels, Jewish rebels, made this their last stand against the Romans. So as the Romans were about to breach their walls, the historian Josephus records that they actually committed mass suicide instead of becoming slaves. You know, the men really, if, if they had been captured, the men would have been killed, and then the women and children would have become slaves. So rather than, than suffer that, they, they committed mass suicide. And then, of course, that, you know, this kind of martyr, self-martyr, um, really, you know, struck the people, and, and it was shocking but to this day, one of the mottos of the Israeli Defense Force is Masada shall never fall again. Um, and then several IDF units actually hold their swearing in ceremonies at Masada. So really cool place to visit. It's, it's right on the western shore of the Dead Sea. So you've got some great views of the, of the valley below. Um, King Herod really left his mark on Israel. So he, as I mentioned, he was hated. He was a tyrant. But he had all these building projects. You know, he was all about ingratiating himself and and you know having nice places for him to visit. Um, and he also built built the temple in um, in Jerusalem, which was one of the seven wonders of the world. So his structures really caused visitors to marvel at at the uh, the architectural capacity that they had in that day. So another one of Herod's great construction projects was the city of Caesarea, and he has a palace which would have been in, in this area. You have a theater over here. There was a temple and, and really he built this harbor. So it wasn't originally a deep water harbor. The harbor is actually um, off to the north here. Um, they they had this cement that they developed that would harden underwater. And it was, you know, if you think about, this is 2000 years ago. And so the technology they had was really rather impressive. Um, so it became a deep water harbor and, and as we will read, you know, a lot of boats came in and out of, of Caesarea. Um, it's the location, Caesarea is notable, it's the location where the gospel first went out to Gentiles. Uh, and then Acts 12 records that Herod Agrippa died in the theater, and then lots of Paul's, you know, Paul's impassioned pleas before uh, some, some later Herods occurred here in Caesarea. All right, talking about Magi coming uh, of the east came to Jerusalem. So I mentioned the Parthians. A lot of scholars assume the Magi were actually Parthians. They might have been from Arabia, but in any case, they were not Jewish, not from the area. And so you hear the see the three men on camels approaching Bethlehem. And I will, as I said earlier, I'll continue my destruction of all that you love and adore about the Christmas story that we started previously. So the um, in our nativity scenes, we often see the shepherds and three wise men together. The Bible doesn't record that they visited Jesus at the same time. Um, by the time the wise men show up, they're actually in a house in Bethlehem and not in a stable. So later, Herod will give a decree to kill boys two years and younger. So this visit could have happened up to two years later. The, uh, the Magi saw the star. The shepherds, there's no uh, recording that the shepherds saw a star. The time of year again is not mentioned, and December is a probably a highly unlikely month to bring a caravan across the desert. So just throwing that out there. And then again, uh, the Bible does not say that there were only three men or three wise men. Uh, we'll see in a minute that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. So it's kind of unlikely that three guys on camels would have caused this. They were probably thinking that this was a uh, a Parthian military incursion or, or an advanced party uh, sent out to, you know, here, here's, here's going to be the terms of peace. Uh, otherwise, there's a whole army behind us, you know, who knows back in those days. Um, Keener notes that Magi were pagan astrologers. So in that day, um, astrology might have been considered more of a hard science <laughs> than, uh, than kind of the, the paganism we consider today. It was still pagan, but uh, they, they, they had scholars that were devoted to this. Um, so even though these magi were pagan, God had chosen to reveal himself to them. There is a tradition that Daniel put all this in motion in, um, in, in the early chapters of Daniel. We know that he was placed as administrator over several groups, and one of those groups uh, was the, the magi. So there, the thought is that he, he passed on this prophecy that, hey, when you see the star, it means the Messiah is born. So who knows? It's just, it's just a good tradition. That he saw the star could also be a reference to Numbers 24-7, where uh, it's uh, Balaam, who is also a Gentile, said, Thou shalt come forth a star out of Jacob. So lots of interesting things around, lots of interesting traditions that uh, surround the star. 
When Herod the king heard it, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. As we said earlier, it could have been a threat of military incursion that stirred the people up, or it, it also just as easily could have been a situation where if Herod's not happy, then nobody, <laughs> ain't, ain't nobody happy. Um, Herod provided many jobs with his building projects. Ultimately, he was hated by the people. So rumors of a prophesied new king could have spread really, really quickly. Chuck Missler sees this um, as a potential insult when the Magi said, where is he that has been born king of the Jews? So as we mentioned earlier, Herod had the Roman Senate proclaim Herod king of the Jews. But again, he was not Jewish by birth. So it's kind of a, you know, we're not looking for you, uh, Turkey, as, as Chuck would say. Uh, you know, where's the, show us the real king. We know it's not you. So where was he born? Verse 5, they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring him me word, bring me word so that I too may come and worship him. Yeah, right. Uh, spoiler alert, Herod had no intention of worshiping Jesus. Out of you will come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. We've talked in previous videos about Matthew's selective editing and very loose paraphrasing and interpretation of these Old Testament prophecies. Uh, you know, the critics claim that he is clearly taking things out of context. Um, he is. <laughs> well, we've we've mentioned that before. Um, you will shepherd my people. Israel is found in Second Samuel five. And then he's also quoting a passage from Micah five, verse two, about the uh, the Messiah being born in Bethlehem. So it seems strange to us. It, it's totally acceptable by uh, the rabbinic standards of that day to kind of mix and mesh these two passages. And Lancaster would rephrase this as the ruler coming forth from Bethlehem is Messiah, the son of David, who will shepherd Israel just as David of Bethlehem did. So he's drawing a, a connection based on David's being from Bethlehem and Micah 5 explicitly um, referencing Bethlehem there. And we'll see Jesus doing this to some extent when we get into the, the Sabbath healings, which we'll talk about um, in several lessons down the road. Keener makes an interesting note. He says that the scribes, so, so Herod doesn't know where Messiah is to be born, uh, but he consults the scribes who, you know, look it up in, in the books, and then they say, yeah, he's born in Bethlehem. Um, so the scribes had head knowledge. They knew where he was going to be born, and now they've just received a potential sign that this birth had occurred, and yet this, they do nothing with it, right? You would think, okay, hey, put two and two together. Maybe something's going on here that we need to investigate, but they don't. Um, and to me, there's, that just shows there's a huge difference in knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. If you know Jesus, you're going to take some action. Um, that's not what the scribes did back then. So again, um, although they're today separated by a security fence, uh, Jerusalem and Bethlehem are not that far from each other, maybe about six miles. Um, we notice that uh, you know definitely some time has passed, so this is not the same time as when Jesus was born in the stable. Um, the verse 11 mentions a house where the family was staying, so it, it's, it seems like they had moved on from the, from the stable uh, in, into some kind of maybe a, a relative's house, or maybe they were borrowing a room or something like that. It's a fair question to ask, why didn't they return to Nazareth? So they were they came from Nazareth uh, for the census, and then uh, Jesus was born. So why didn't they just, you know, after, after uh, going to the temple, you know, which would have been within after Mary's purification, why didn't they just go back to Nazareth? Uh, one speculation is that the shame surrounding and the, and the gossip and all that was too great surrounding the unusual circumstances of Mary's pregnancy. And so maybe they just, they kind of wanted to let that die down before they went back. I mean, who knows? We don't really know. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. So again, this is very similar to the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night that led the children of Israel through the wilderness. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. 
And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Here's an example of some gold coins, a um, little bit after the time of Jesus, but uh, Roman, Roman gold coins. The three gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh are probably where we get the tradition, the tradition of three wise men. We often picture troves of, of gold being delivered to Jesus, but scripture doesn't tell us how much gold or uh, what happened to it, right? We, we do know that the offering of the two pigeons at the temple that we looked at in the previous lesson indicates Mary and Joseph were poor, although the Magi visit could have happened after that time. Um, but in any case, we get no indication that the family had any significant wealth either during Jesus' childhood or after. So this, again, this picture that we have of, you know, like <laughs> these big pirate-like treasure chests and gold pouring out of them um, may, may or may not be fiction. So you can see from this picture, myrrh is like a, a resin. The Bible records a number of uses for myrrh. So in Exodus, uh, it's used as incense. Perfume is uh, noted in Psalm 45. A cosmetic uh, is used in Eth Esther. Mark talks about using it as an anesthetic. So remember, uh, Jesus is on the cross and, and they give him this uh, the myrrh to help dull the pain. And then finally, it's an embalming ointment um, in John 19. So lots of uses for myrrh. So they were warned in a dream to depart by another way. So Herod uh, was, you know, angry and he was, he was, you know, not didn't like the fact that he was double crossed. Again, Jerusalem and Bethlehem are very close to each other, and in fact, there was a another one of Herod's buildings called Herodium, which is right by Jerusalem. So it's it's possible that if this were a big entourage, they could have been spotted. Uh, you know, leaving or coming or going or whatever. The the main road in and out of town would have taken them back through Jerusalem, so they ha obviously had to find another way. Ultimately, we don't know which way they went. Um, this is a view of the En Gedi region, and En Gedi is where David wrote a lot of the Psalms. It's a it's a, this oasis um, place that is just has water, fresh water, and and it's just absolutely gorgeous place to visit. Uh, this shows the area where the Magi may have departed if they escaped Herod. Uh, from this way, they, they might have taken a boat across the Dead Sea um, and then down, headed off to the south. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord had appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Boland notes that Joseph and Mary likely traveled west um, from Bethlehem and then down into the Ella Valley, which is, Ella Valley is interesting because that's where David and Goliath took place. So again, it is Matthew presenting, you know, Matthew's big thing is Jesus is the son of David. So just as David killed Goliath, um, the, the child who was the son of David would defeat ultimately all of the enemies of God's people in order to establish the Lord's kingdom on earth. So just some interesting um, geography here in, in history, how uh, they may have gone right by the Valley of Ella. So they fled to Egypt. Um, a very large Jewish community was in Alexandria. So we assume that that's where they went, although we, we don't really know where in Egypt they went. There's lots of traditions actually um, about where they went and a lot of Egyptian towns, you know, claim to, to be the place where Jesus and Mary and Joseph, um, you know, fled to. This is a mosaic that is in um, Cairo and it depicts Joseph and Mary traveling along the bank of the Nile. Again, this is another one of those prophecies where he says, out of Egypt, I have called my son. That is a clearly a reference to the people of Israel leaving Egypt. And so critics and groups called anti-missionaries claim that Matthew has taken this prophecy completely out of context. Um, so anti-missionaries, in case you're not familiar with that term, there are, uh, so if you've heard of groups like Jews for Jesus, 
and other messianic groups who make it their mission to minister directly to the Jewish people. Anti-missionaries are uh, Jews who you know, block, they, they, they want to stand in the way of that. So there's a group called Jews for Judaism, and so they, they follow Jews for Jesus around, and then they pre present you know, counter arguments and that kind of thing. So again, Matthew did take this prophecy out of context. Um, the point is that Jesus epitomizes and fulfills Israel's history. That's, that's what Matthew is communicating. Keener notes, Isaiah narrows down the mission of Israel as a whole to one who can completely fill that mission and suffer on behalf of the whole people. So we could phrase it like, since Israel is God's son and Jesus is God's son, then in some sense, Jesus must be equivalent to Israel. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. This was fulfilled by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted, for they are no more. So this decree by Herod definitely uh, recalls that of Pharaoh who instructed the midwives to kill the Hebrew boys in uh, Exodus chapter 1. And then, like exactly like Moses did, Jesus miraculously escapes the fate of the other male children who were, were killed and executed. There is no extra biblical or archaeologic confirmation of this by Herod, but knowing what we know of Herod, it, it is entirely consistent uh, in his lust for power and his you know, doesn't even think twice about murdering innocent people, that, that this is something he would have done. So this is the passage where we learn that Jesus could have been up to two years old um, by because Herod killed the, the babies two years old and under. So Rachel's tomb is near Bethlehem today, and, and it's a holy site for, for the Jewish people, and they regularly pray at the tomb of Rachel, who is considered one of the matriarchs. So in this prophecy that uh, Matthew is quoting, Jeremiah is imagining Rachel weeping for ch her children as they were carried off to Babylon. Um, and despite the fact that Rachel lived over a thousand years before that event happened. So Matthew is really taking that and, and reapplying it to uh, this act by Herod, um, saying that Rachel of Bethlehem again had cause to mourn for the loss of her children. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth. So that was spoken by the prophet might be fulfilled that he would be called a Nazarene. And then Luke 2.39 has a parallel uh, comment. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. So in Matthew 2 verse 20, uh, rise, go to the land of Israel. This is another comparison to Moses. So Jesus and Moses have a lot of parallels. This is, I mentioned earlier, um, Herodium, and this is where archaeologists believe that Herod has been buried. Herod was buried. Um, they discovered the remains in 2007. Most of it was destroyed, and so what we're looking at in this picture is a reconstruction. So there's a, here's an antidote, again, that will tell you <laughs> all you need to know about Herod. Herod. Um, he was hated by the people, and they were likely to be you know, jubilant when he died. There's a famous story that he had um, several prominent and popular Jewish sages arrested right when he knew he was about to die. And he gave orders that as soon as he died, those sages were to be murdered. Thus, that would cause the people to mourn. And thus, Herod could claim, when I died, there was mourning throughout the land. Um, so that just kind of shows you his ego and his, his craziness and paranoia. But fortunately, after he died, his sister Salome hurried to the prison and, and lied to the guards that Herod had ordered all the sages released. So guess what? <laughs> now Israel had two reasons to rejoice. Herod died and their sages uh, were not executed. 
So Archelaus, uh, to use a biblical term, we might call him a train wreck. <laughs> um, his, he exhibited his father's worst flaws, and he was so bad that the Romans ultimately deposed him. So he was, he was bad news all around. Joseph instead opted for the ter territory of Antipas, uh, slightly less dangerous, although that's, that's a relative term when you're talking about the Herods. Um, Antipas is the Herod who had John the Baptist arrested and executed and he is the one who ultimately mocked Jesus before his crucifixion. So when we get to the, the end of the, the Gospels, we'll see in the crucifixion, uh, the arrest scene that he goes before Pilate. And Pilate learns that he's from, Jesus is from Galilee. And so he thinks there's might be a jurisdiction issue. So he hands Jesus over to Archelaus to be interrogated. I'm sorry, to Antipas to be interrogated. And, uh, you know, Jesus remains silent. And Antipas just, you know, gets irritated and mocks him and then sends him back to Pilate. So he dwelt in a city called Nazareth. So in Jesus' day, the, the population of Nazareth was probably only a couple hundred people. Um, archaeologists believe many people actually moved here from near Bethlehem, just, just as Joseph and Mary and Jesus did. Um, since Netzer means branch, and we have a lot of David's people here, uh, these might have been the original branch Davidians. And if you're not old enough to understand that joke, you might want to consider yourself blessed. Verse 40, as the child grew and became strong, uh, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is a uh, carpenter shop that's located in the Eretz Israel Museum in Tel Aviv. There's also a recreation called uh, Nazareth Village that is in the town of Nazareth itself. So lots of uh, historical insight as to what the, a first century carpenter shop might have looked like. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. And when the feast ended, they, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. So this is a satellite photo that shows two possible routes uh, to and from Nazareth and Jerusalem. Um, so th the one on the left goes through Samaria and the one on the right kind of avoids Samaria and goes around through the, the Jordan Valley and then um, down into uh, to Jericho. Jericho is about here. And then there's a very steep ascent that is about 18 miles, but you climb uh, over 3,000 feet. <laughs> so you have to be in great shape to do that one, um, or you can do this hill route here. So the Torah commands Israelite men to appear before him for three feasts that occur each year. Um, even today, we still have Jewish families go up to Jerusalem for these three annual feasts. Uh, David Stern notes that in that day, tradition made allowances for folks who lived far away, including granting an exception to the requirement for those who would have traveled, you know, very long distances. So it, he notes that despite this, Joseph and Mary went to the Passover every year. They observed it every year. So a lot of commentators draw a parallel to um, this episode at when Jesus was 12 to the modern uh, bar mitzvah. Um, it, it's, it may have been distant relatives, but really the bar mitzvah that we know today was not recorded until the Middle Ages, uh, but it does appear to have roots in, in whatever was happened. So there might have been some coming of age ceremony that, that uh, kind of led, was the precursor to a bar mitzvah. So it's um, many uh, bar mitzvahs are held at the Western Wall. And uh, when I was there last time, I, you know, it was, it's kind of fun to see because there's, there's, uh, it's really an occasion that I can compare it to baptism where you've got family coming in and uh, you, know, you may have a little gathering afterwards. It's really a, a joyous occasion. Um, so this 13 year old, he's, uh, I don't know if you can see him, he's, he's, he's there. Um, and it's really, he's allowed, he's a, he's a made his progression from 
child to manhood and he can read the Torah uh, on his own in the synagogue and, and all that kind of stuff. So a day's journey, as I mentioned, that ascent of, it's called the ascent of Adumim, and it's really, it's, it's 3,500 foot. So they would have, have gone down this 18 mile, 3,500 foot descent into Jericho and then realized Jesus wasn't there. And then they had to return back and go up that same hill. So not an insignificant, uh, <laughs> not an insignificant walk. And after three days, I mean, imagine losing your child for three days and not knowing where he is. That's, that's you know, sobering to think about. Um, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. So uh, one thing is um, Jesus, I, I highly doubt Jesus is being snotty or disrespectful here. The commandment to honor one's father and mother was one of the most sacred commandments uh, of, of the 10 and of the entire law. So uh, we'll, we'll see this in verse the next verse where it's recorded that Jesus is submissive to them. Perhaps Jesus is saying that in, in light of what had already been revealed to them back when he was born, they really should have known where to look um, if he wasn't with them. So after three days, they found Jesus in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers. Um, it's surprising when you go to the Temple Mount today how big it is. It's about 35 acres. <laughs> so we, we think of this, uh, you know, we kind of see the picture from far away, and it looks like maybe it's not bigger than a football field. It's actually about the size of 25 football fields. So imagine, uh, you know, could've, they could have gone back to Jerusalem and, and gone to the temple area. And if there were lots of crowds, they could have spent several hours uh, looking for Jesus before they actually found him. It notes that he was answering, uh, asking questions, and uh, you know, we may interpret that as challenging them. It really wasn't challenging in those days. We we may find answering a question with a question to be irritating, but actually in that day, asking an intelligent question was a way of demonstrating that you understood the material. So it was uh, some highly uh, intellectual discourse going on, and, that, and that's why they were amazed. Because I know when I was 13, I wasn't having very many <laughs> um, intelligent conversations. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And her mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So it's not exactly true to say we don't know anything of Jesus' childhood. Um, verse 52 tells us a lot that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor. And here's a picture of Nazareth, and we'll talk about Nazareth much more um, when Jesus begins his ministry, and we'll, we'll talk about um, the day at the synagogue uh, that he teaches and is ultimately rejected. So there is a following the Messiah um, episode that is on what was Jesus like as a child? And that is episode two. And you can see the link there and I'll, I'll put the link in the uh, in the description. Um, this, it doesn't cover the Magi, but it covers the part where the family returns from Egypt to Nazareth, Nazareth and then goes to the episode uh, in at the temple when Jesus was 12. Craig DeHutt is the, the pastor and he's the one on the ball cap in the videos. He, can, he concludes with this. Even without very many details of Jesus' upbringing, you can clearly see the rural influence in how he taught. In the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew 5 to 7, he will speak about salt and lamps, birds, lilies, and grass, grapes, figs, and trees. His parables, which are in Matthew 13, had a rural focus, seeds, weeds, leaven, fields, merchants, and fishing. So the hut concludes the time Jesus spends growing up in the rustic town of Nazareth with the humble family of Joseph and Mary provided the influence and upbringing that God wanted his son to have. And that's going to lead to our application for this lesson. So continuing in the following the Messiah study guide that I have, Craig DeHutt writes, no one would have been attracted to Jesus because of his education or his zip code. 
If anyone was attracted to Jesus, it was for what he taught, what he did, and who they believed him to be. And then his application for you and for me is, are we attracted to Jesus for the right reasons? So think about some time, meditate on that. And then in the next section, uh, we will look at John the Baptist and we will get into the formal start of Jesus' ministry.